Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to my podcast, Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. In today's podcast, I interview psychiatrist Dr. Ellen Vora. She's a holistic psychiatrist, acupuncturist and yoga teacher. She takes a functional medicine approach to mental health, considering the whole person and addressing imbalances at their root. Dr. Vora received her BA from Yale and her MD from Columbia, and she's board certified in psychiatry and integrative holistic medicine. In today's interview, we talk about her new book, The Anatomy of Anxiety. We really focus in on, instead of asking, how can I stop feeling so anxious? We should actually be asking, what is my anxiety telling me? It's natural to resist uncomfortable feelings, And culturally, we've been so taught to view anxiety as a nuisance or something to suppress into submission. But when we do this, we miss out on its critical guidance. There's a better way to approach this, to rather learn to tolerate anxiety long enough to hear what change is necessary. Anxiety has also often been associated as being weak and as a woman's problem, historically, which couldn't be further from the truth. So we discuss this and we dive into anxiety around postpartum depression and menopause and so much more. But before we begin, if you want to listen to my podcast ad-free, then you can subscribe to my Patreon account. The link and details will be in the show notes. You also get bonus episodes and live Q&As. And as I always say, this podcast is for educational purposes and is not medical advice. If you need medical advice, please contact the appropriate medical professional. And now, on to today's podcast. Before we dive into today's podcast... I want to tell you about an exciting new project, one many of you have been asking for, which is now open for enrollment, my NeuroCycle Certified Facilitator Program. This program is a four-day in-person training with me where you'll learn the fundamentals of my theory and the NeuroCycle so you can use these strategies with your clients and to elevate your coaching business or private practice. Our first training is August third through six, and takes place in Dallas, Texas. When you become a certified facilitator, you'll join our exclusive directory, which goes out to hundreds of thousands of people looking for extra help with their mental health. This means that finding clients will become even easier, and you'll become part of our private network of facilitators, where you can meet and connect with like-minded individuals, get help, and have access to many great resources. Spots are extremely limited and already filling up. So if you're interested, just go to neurocycleinstitute.com for more details and to register for our first training. And for just a few days, we are offering 25% off. Just use the code INAUG25, that's I-N-A-U-G-25. The link and details will be in the show notes. Dr. Ellen Vora, what a pleasure to see you again. I always enjoy chatting. It's just so lovely connecting. We have so much in common. We could talk for hours before, during and after. There's just so much that we share in common. And thank you for your great work. And thank you for coming back on the podcast. Dr. Caroline, it's so good to be here. I'm sure I I share this with your listeners, but I learned so much from you and you take such a warm, approachable take on mental health. And I just appreciate you for it so much. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I feel likewise with you. Your page is so encouraging and your work you do is just so kind as well and so helpful and practical and it's just so wonderful to have someone who's so qualified and so immersed in the medical system but you haven't got blocked by the neuroreductionism of the medical system you've been able to take the best of and bring it bring a much more holistic approach to helping people so this is really great so thank you for what you do so you've just released a book the anatomy of anxiety understanding and overcoming the body's fear response and this, your, your breakdown intrigued me, and I was chatting to you about this before we started. You make a comment, it's not, your first part, part one is called, it's not all in your head. And I love that because how many years, and you talk about women's ang- mental health in here, so anxiety in women, and I want to touch on that. But for how many years people, doctors would say, I can't find any reason in your body, it must be in your head, almost in a derogatory sense. Meanwhile, our mind is driving everything, but then we've progressed even further, understanding that mind, brain, and body are completely integrated and three separate but integrated systems. So the initial, I think, derogatory comment of it's all in your head is like, oh, this is not really real, to, oh, it's only in your head, meaning your brain, because the brain was seen as, you know, the organ that did everything, but if you're dead, your brain does nothing, so it cannot be the organ that does everything, to realizing our mind is embodied, brain and body. And I think, you know, well, I don't know, I think I know, you captured this in your approach. So can you to just 
dive in a little bit and tell us why you've actually said it's not all in your head, the age of anxiety, avoidable anxiety, purposeful anxiety, that's first little section. Let's talk a little bit around that. Yeah, I really like the way you put that, that our mind is embodied. And I think that when we say it's it's all in your head, you know, it, it's a sort of two-part thing that we're doing there. On one hand, exactly as you said it, it's dismissive. It's someone saying, I'm really struggling here. Something's really not right. And when you go to the ER with a panic attack and you're like, I'm not okay. And the doctor says, you're just, quote unquote, you're just having a panic attack. You know, it's all in your head. And it's so dismissive and so invalidating. And, you know, it makes people feel shame. It makes people sort of tail between their legs, kind of walk out of the ER thinking they wasted the doctor's time. All of this is such a miss for addressing this very real suffering that people are going through. And I think also when we say it's all in your head, what we're alluding to is what we've been indoctrinated with since about the 1990s, this idea that mental health is the result of a genetically determined chemical imbalance, that it's hereditary, it's our destiny, and that it has to do with our brain chemistry. And I've started to realize in my practice that this brain chemistry that we so myopically focus on is often a downstream effect of something happening elsewhere in the body. So the real paradigm shift in my practice is to understand that much of mental health, not all of it, but a lot of it is really just our physical health and how that impacts the brain. And then that manifests as what we call mental health symptoms. And so the entry point that works more effectively, more quickly is actually to address mental health on the level of the physical body. And to see the physical body as brain and body, not just one thing. Isn't that so important? Because there yeah. is a there is that the, the move, as you say, from so accurately from the mid 90s, because I started practicing in the in the late 80s, early 90s. And so, I mean, this like really ages me, but I've watched this transition of 38 years to 40 years of how we went from actually saying the brain couldn't change, but it's paradoxical to a more holistic holistic approach, but which is good, but bad, the brain can't change, to saying, oh, the brain can change, but a less holistic approach. And it didn't make any sense to me. And the 90s was really the point where things started turning around and the the drugs and, and chemical imbalance and here we are 40 years later and the billions of dollars spent and there's still no established neurobiological cause. What's causing is the environment that we're going through, that what we're living in and all the, and obviously we're not ruling out TBI and, and tumors and the, you know definite neurophysiological things that can happen. But as you so beautifully said, we've got to look at the impact on our brain and body of the environment, which then is impacting our mental health. So we can't just look at one organ. We've got to look at the entire body as a person who's alive in life. A little different, isn't it? (laughs) Functional medicine, we say genes load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. And I consider... It's a, to me, it's a hopeful message because our genes, you know, we have the ability to have some impact on our genes in terms of our epigenetics. You know, if we meditate, if we get better sleep, if we eat better, this impacts our DNA. It impacts our DNA for our offspring and even our grandchildren. But I also think that in a way, the environment is the part we much more immediately control. And so when we can feel a little bit stuck by our genes, we can feel like we look at a line of family history of mental health issues and we think it's our destiny, there's no escaping it, but it's really only a piece of the puzzle. And the environment is a very big determinant of our mental well-being, and that's the part we control. Some people bristle at that because it feels like a responsibility. It can sometimes feel, I notice sometimes you have to be very gentle around the idea where some people might be prone to feeling judged or shamed. The idea that- Control, yeah. Yeah, or and also the idea that, well, if we're responsible for our environment and our environment is responsible for our mental health, then we almost feel like we're to blame for our mental health. And and that's not how I see it at all. I, I never want to blame or shame anybody, but I think that it's an empowering message if we think about it in a certain way, which is once we get educated on what are the aspects of our modern environment that are causing mental health issues, we can start to get strategic. We can make little incremental shifts, whatever feels approachable, which can be difficult when we're struggling, but you just reach for whatever feels within reach. And you can make little adjustments that start to make a big difference in terms of how we feel. Rest and making sure we have good quality me time every day is so important for our mental and physical well-being. 
the brain functions best when we give it time to relax. One way I love to have rest and tap into what I call my happiness mindset is by playing games. Indeed, taking part in a little playful competition makes me smile, which is why I love Best Fiends. Best Fiends, that's friends without the R, satisfies my need for more me time and more fun. It is a mobile puzzle game that is free to download and super engaging. The game features tons of cute characters that can help you solve thousands of fun puzzles. The more you play, the more characters you collect. And the more you win, the more challenges you face. Plus, once you've downloaded Best Fiends, you can play anywhere, even without an internet connection. Which is great if you're stuck without Wi-Fi, which often happens when I'm traveling. This amazing puzzle game is one of my favorite ways to treat my brain to a much needed recharge. I am currently on level 650 called the Rocket Rumble, where I'm getting closer to saving the land of Minutia from all these bad slugs. And with thousands of levels, you can play Best Fiends as long as you want and never get bored. No wonder the fun puzzle game has had over 100 million downloads. Download Best Fiends for free from the App Store or Google Play. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. The link in detail will be in the show notes. That's really, really beautifully put. And it's it's very, really moving from the bio, bio, bio model back to the bio psychosocial spiritual model. Did you see just this last week that we know that Dr. Daniel Puris of the United Nations, a special rapporteur, he released a report a few years ago, and he's been constantly pushing that we need to move more into looking at the whole co- impact of environment, not just looking at the biology. Now the WHO has also joined forces, and they released a 300-page document last week that both the UN and the WHO are calling for a move back to the biopsychosocial spiritual model. And I know that that's a, a massively wonderful move, and it's out there, and I know it's going to take a little bit of time to filter through. But at least we've got two umbrella massive organizations starting to shift our view. And then we've got people on the ground like you and I uh, helping people to be educated uh, on a grassroots level. And hopefully, you know, we can close the gap. <laughs> so. we're, we're ripe for this. We are ready for this change. It's more needed now than ever. And, you know, when I was writing this book and in, in basically through 2020 and a little bit of 2021, I kept asking myself, what world am I writing this for? And I couldn't tell, was I writing it where we going to be in an ongoing pandemic? Were we going to be over the pandemic? And I didn't anticipate that we would be flirting with World War III. But so, you know, this stress and anxiety levels and the trauma, it, it's just beyond anything I could have anticipated. But I think about how, because of this precipitous rise in mental health issues that we've seen through the pandemic and now everything going on overseas is, is of course, contributing, it does help the world recognize we need to do something about this. And I I struggle with the idea of just a blanket statement of increasing access to mental health care. I love the idea. I think it's the spirit there is right. What you know, decrease stigma, increase awareness, increase access and coverage and prioritizing mental health. I'm on board with all of that. But I think we probably agree that the field of mental health as it exists today is not ready to properly catch people and really help them in the ways that people need support and without doing harm. And that's my concern about it. And so people like you and me, I think we're really making it possible for people to approach their mental health. You know, of course they need to see professional help when indicated, but there's also a lot that we can do for ourselves. There's a lot that's affordable and accessible and effective that we can do for ourselves. And it doesn't need to be gatekeeped in the ivory tower of, you know, seeking help with a professional. A lot of it we can approach today on our own. And so I'm really interested in spreading that message because I think that makes it a lot more accessible to more people getting help today. Uh, really, that's really so, so well put because it's, as you say, we, we want to increase access and we want to get insurance coverage and we want to get all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, when they say increased access to mental health care, you and I both know and go at the back of our mind, oh no, that means more labels, more diagnoses and more treatment. You know, when you diagnose and treat, we've popped it into the medical model and we've taken it out of, hey, the environment. So now it becomes the individual. So the very thing they're trying to destigmatize actually increases stigmatization because now, oh, well, you know, it's your fault. There's something wrong with you. Meanwhile, the environment's a mess. I mean, the Ukrainian-Russian wars you mentioned and COVID, and before that, we already had this people dying younger from preventable lifestyle issues because of our mental health impacting our brain and our body, which, you know, your, your huge level of expertise. So, yeah, we don't want to just have more 
diagnoses and labels. We want to give people accessible ways of managing their mind. And you do that. As you say with your book, this is one of the, your objectives of why you do what you do. Our modern environment in certain ways is just getting worse. Social media and inhumane working conditions and processed foods. And we're just more and more estranged from our, getting our fundamental human needs met for community, for nature, for rest. And I think that psychopharmacology is a complicated topic and I have deeply nuanced views on it. But I think that when we talk about increasing access to mental health care, often what that means is you walk into a doctor's office you might walk out eight to 15 minutes later with a prescription. And for some people that does the trick and that's great. I count that as a success, but I've just known far too many people for whom not only did it not help, but in certain ways it took them down a path that was ultimately harmful. And we just don't have the right way of supporting someone in a more 360 degree way to really know is, is medication what's indicated here, or is it cognitive behavioral therapy, or is it removing gluten from the diet or addressing inflammation or getting off the birth control pill, or, you know, is it just protecting sleep? Sometimes that's that intervention alone can make an enormous difference. And so I, I long for a time when we're really catching people properly and not just always autopilot def- of defaulting to medication, which helps some and doesn't help some and occasionally harms. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I just recently interviewed Joanna, Dr. Joanna Moncrief. I'm sure you've heard of her and she's the leader in the field of leading psychiatrists. And she talks about the drug versus disease disease model for understanding medication. And and so to just to, to underscore your point, if if they go in and eight to 15 minutes later, they come out with the prescription, as long as they're aware that this is not a medicine fixing an underlying disease, that this is actually a drug that creates a psychoactive effect and therefore changes the state of the brain and therefore the state of how your mind is going to feel as an maybe a potential numbing, temporary numbing experience, but it's not fixing the problem. And that's where I think you and I have issue, is, is, as, as Joanna Moncrief has issue as well, is that, we, if, yes, if you get that drug and that label, but as long as people aren't told or misinformed that this is now fixing an underlying disease. Because that in itself is misinformation and can lead people down that path that you mentioned. But if they understand, hey, this is just going to take the edge off. It's just a short period of time. I just needed to get through something. Well, then they're informed and then they made a good decision. They then can be prepared for how to manage that process of, of the medication. I don't know how you feel about that. I couldn't agree more. And, and I think that that's just it. We were somewhat indoctrinated through marketing campaigns for a few decades now that what it is is a genetic chemical imbalance. You have a low serotonin tank, basically, and that this pill corrects it, almost as if there was serotonin in the pill. And of course, the brain, the most complex computer in the universe, it doesn't work quite so simply. And I, and I think for me, it's almost a compulsive need to find a more elegant solution. When I meet somebody with depression or anxiety, I'm asking why. To me, depression and anxiety, if they meet criteria for that diagnosis, that's not the end of the inquiry. That's the beginning of the inquiry. That's just how they're showing up and manifesting symptomatically. And then I want to know, well, what's causing it? Is it inflammation? Is it dietary intolerance? Is it you know something going on with their gut health? Is it something going on with their sleep or their hormones and so on and so forth? So I'm investigating what's out of balance in this person's body or life. And I want to identify that and address it at the root. And to me, that feels like the elegant solution. I rarely think that depression or anxiety is a Lexapro deficiency disorder. And so that to me is never actually addressing the true root cause, though I do occasionally leverage it as a bridge. If somebody is just struggling so much that they can't work through the diet and lifestyle modifications, it's a wonderful bridge to get somebody out of such a deep hole where they can start making those changes. But I don't approach that bridge lightly because what to me is most damning about it is that for some people, and it's hard to predict who will fall into this category, but for some people, it can be really difficult to get off of psychiatric medication. So I don't approach it lightly. I do think it's helpful, but it's something I want people to feel really informed about when they're consenting to it, because it's sometimes a necessary bridge and that's the right trade-off to make. And sometimes it's, it's not the right approach. And that is not an eight to 15 minute conversation. That, no. is a, that is a holistic narrative that you say, the holistic approach. So, well, Dr. Ellen, you're just amazing the way you explain that. And I want to dive in and take this a little deeper because you, in the second part, you talk about the false anxiety and, and then the third part, you talk about true anxiety. So can you explain why you've defined them about, like that? And I'm just going to read out the chapter heads because they're great. 
So under false anxiety, you've put, I know you know, but the listeners don't, the anxiety of modern life, tired and wired, tech anxiety, food for thought, body on fire, women's hormonal health and anxiety. And we should definitely touch, definitely dive a little deep in that. The silent epidemic, discharging stress and cultivating relaxation. So you give us a really great definition. I, I really love how you approach this. And then true anxiety, you talk about tuning in and sensitive in every sense and connection is calming. So I love how you have brought together the concept of really tuning in to the message of anxiety, seeing it as a messenger. And I'm sure you're familiar with the research. They actually did it at this, a lot of it, but there was a recent study done, University of Texas and University of Tokyo, where it's about a couple of years now, where they showed that the way you perceive stress and the way you perceive your emotions is going to influence your whole body. So this is what unites the language, it's the world we live in. But, and so if you see it as, as anxiety as a disease, that's a chemical imbalance, your chances of healing are actually less than because it becomes a very complex disease versus if you see, okay, anxiety is a message and there's different ways of looking at it and, and dealing with it. So there's, I've set the platform. I'm going to keep quiet. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> you know, in our training, we have the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, our kind of mental health Bible. And we're taught to think about anxiety in terms of different categories like panic disorder, with or without agoraphobia, generalized anxiety disorder, so on and so forth. And the idea there is that it's supposed to steer management. You know, maybe one indicates medication, one might indicate cognitive behavioral therapy. I started to find that in my practice, these labels were next to worthless. They were not actually guiding management meaningfully for me. And what started to make more sense was dividing anxiety into two categories, what I call false anxiety and true anxiety. And I'm going to caveat that. I recognize that calling it false anxiety can at first glance feel invalidating. And that's not the intention whatsoever. It's not to invalidate the very real suffering of any false mood. It's I was in a state of false depression for nearly a decade of my life. That was very real life-altering suffering. The falseness speaks to the fact that there's a physical basis and there's a physical path out. So this is not anxiety that's your deep inner truth. It's not your true north. It's not core to your being. It's basically a stress response triggered by some subtle aspect of modern life, usually a seemingly benign behavior that puts our body in a stress response and that feels identical to anxiety. And to me, it's unnecessary anxiety. It's avoidable anxiety. And I like people to identify the underlying root cause, address it, and then walk away from that anxiety. So that's false anxiety. True anxiety, on the other hand, is purposeful anxiety. It's not something to pathologize. Ideally, it's not something to medicate away. It's a very important communication from within. And it's not something that we can gluten-free or decaf coffee our way out of. It's not. It doesn't have a physical basis. It's the way that we're tuned in and sensing what's not right in our personal lives, in our communities, in the world around us, and that's something that I do think it can create quite a bit of suffering. And the way I communicate about true anxiety is to really help people slow down, get still and listen to this call to action that we get from within and take some steps to take action. And once we start taking action, we're not just sitting, feeling helpless in our true anxiety. We feel engaged and motivated. It's driving purposeful action and that I think does transmute the feeling. It doesn't quite cause so much suffering. And so that's how I divide anxiety. And I found that that's really helped my patients move through anxiety and sometimes eliminate it and sometimes really see it as a communication and a call to action and a, something that generates purposeful action. That's really wonderful. And because you also what you, if I'm just reading your book and, and knowing you and knowing how you approach things, correct me if I'm wrong, you're also not saying one is more weighty than the other. You're basically saying in your in one person's life, it could be that the true anxiety is 99% of the issue. And maybe there's, you know, there's obviously because anxiety works through the brain. Anxiety is an emotion that's a signal and it's coming from life experiences and we use our brain to experience life. So, but it could be that it's the experience in the environment that's the major thing. Whereas someone else, it may be that they've had a TBI and it's upset the structure or they've got a major hormonal imbalance and that could be 90% for that person and whatever. So it's, and then that shifts through our life. So one, to, to, to least this, this pattern can shift. It's not necessarily one is more than the other or they equal. 
at any one time there's a ratio happening and it's idiosyncratic to the person's environment, context, life, what they're going through, their physical state, all those kinds of things. Have I understood you correctly? In that's terms exactly of- right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and in a way, each person, you know, I, I work with patients on this and we start with false anxiety. It's the low hanging fruit. We, we go through what I call the false anxiety inventory. We think about what might be an underlying cause of some physical state of imbalance, some stress response in the body. You know, is it chronic sleep deprivation? Is it a disrupted circadian rhythm from too much phone screen after sunset? Is it a gluten intolerance? Is it inflammation? So on and so forth. And I have people just start to reflect and observe how their body's responding to different behaviors. And once we've identified and addressed and removed some of these factors, a lot of people walk away from a decent amount of their anxiety. And then it's usually in that process that we start to see what remains. And and when people develop a practice, whether it's journaling, meditation, I have some people do like a shaking practice. Sometimes it's work with psychedelics in an appropriate setting. We can talk about that. Sometimes it's just our work in psychotherapy. These are opportunities to listen for the true anxiety. And so it sometimes feels like there's this fog of false anxiety over it. And once that clears, we can really get to the true anxiety and, and discern that more meaningful, intuitive message from the noise of false anxiety. And we can slow down and really listen to the message, honor it, heed it. I love that. I really like that. I really like the the fact that you, because the, the low hanging fruit, as you say, is something that you can, you can measure, you can get a hormone test done, you can get blood work done, you can change it, you can reduce inflammation, you can look at homocysteine levels. So these things that can make a person really feel, okay, I'm moving forward. And then, as you say, if there's something left over, which then inevitably is because we've normally got a combination of both, haven't we? And then you can address the other side. And it's interesting how the biological is very often hiding the physical. And I think that's also why we've gone become so neuroreductionistic, where it's all about, you know, the causes in the physical. I mean, well, that's just one part that is disrupting, but it's, and it's almost hiding. You know, it's almost hiding what's really behind there. So it's not the final answer. It's, it's all gone away. You just, you have Lyme disease and that was why you're depressed. You may have Lyme disease and, and you can address it and it's very difficult to address Lyme disease, but it has psychiatric implications. But what about all the, the life experiences that this is actually hidden or something, you know, is that this, this is a good way of approaching it. I love it. Lyme is a really interesting example too, because you know, it has this physical basis. It's a, it's a tick bite. It's a spirochete. And then it often has what I would call a psycho-spiritual quality to it. It has some relationship, and I, I haven't been able to define this, but some relationship to a history of trauma, some relationship to a stressful phase of life. So a lot of illnesses, but I find the conversation that comes up with patients is it's both. You know, if somebody is in crisis and there's a lot going on, it's always a little bit physical and there are things we can address to address the physical aspect, but then there's also always a psycho-spiritual component. And I find that both are necessary, but not sufficient. You know, you kind of have to address both. And so in, in a way, when we are vulnerable to some state of physical imbalance, sometimes has some psycho-spiritual overlay. It, it has some meaning to us. It's a way that our body is communicating. I'm not okay. Help me. Please listen to this, address this. And so it's always both. It's always physical and psycho-spiritual. And it makes sense that because as we've said a couple of times, we experience life with our mind in in our brain. Our mind is using our brain to be able to experience life. So we obviously you just talking, our brain is responding. So if we have if you have a negative experience, your brain will will respond accordingly. The pattern of your mind, a brain follow and body follow the pattern of your mind. So in addressing the false anxiety first, if I understand this correctly, we basically are able to then rule out, the looking, we're looking at kind of the impact of the anxiety. So you kind of got to deal with the impact first because that's really in your face. Yeah. And as you say, it's accessible and then we can get to the deeper stuff because it's yeah. always a combination. And it's different for every person, as you, as you also said. Let's talk about women's health because this is something that, you know, we get, I, I know you do. I'm sure we, you do all the time, I know. But the people asking about things like postpartum depression and about women's hormonal health and the history of, of how, you know, the whole, you, you have such a great chapter here about that. I want to let you explain it. So can you touch on, you know, the history, maybe touch on postpartum depression, 
how it's been mishandled <laughs> and all kinds of things. It's, I know it's a huge question, but it's <laughs> so important. No, I, I, there's just so much to say about it and I'll keep it as concise as I can. I do and think people that, can get the book. They can read the book and read all this and learn all these things. So like postpartum conditions, for example, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety. I think that there's aspects that are being relatively well discussed, which is an understanding. This is an enormous hormonal crash. That's not anyone doing anything wrong. That's just the reality of, of being postpartum, or I should add post-pregnancy loss is also a hormonal crash. But if anybody sort of is familiar with the state of PMS, those days before you get your period for anybody who's in a cycling menstruating body, that's a smaller scale hormone crash, but it causes changes in our mood. We get more irritable, we get more tearful. It might impact our sleep. And after pregnancy loss, after, after delivery, it's an enormous precipitous downslope in, in hormone levels with estrogen and progesterone. And so it's a huge PMS um, and that's going to impact our mood. And in that sense, I think it's just important to let ourselves feel the feelings and have compassion for ourselves, certainly not feel ashamed about it. And to basically move through it with just an eye toward the fact that on some level, it's a false mood. On a tiny level, it's a false mood of just, this is how it feels when our hormones crash. I think there is also, of course, the role transition. There's the way our modern environment, and I'm in the United States, so that's what I identify with is, you know, our, our utter lack of support for in terms of parental leave, in terms of childcare, government subsidized childcare, how we treat mothers, how we just make it at every crossroads harder <laughs> to have children. And, and so there's all of those stressors. I think the part of it that I think is that somewhat of a unique insight that's not being discussed enough is that growing a baby, birthing a baby, potentially hemorrhaging in labor, and potentially nursing a baby is an enormous nutritional depletion. We're basically giving all of our best nutrients to the baby, to the fetus, and then losing so much of those precious nutrients in the blood, in the breast milk. And so postpartum moms are just depleted. And in the best of circumstances, if you have a very nutritious diet with diverse nutrient-dense foods and you have somebody helping you because you can't, it's so hard to have a newborn and cook healthy meals and, and also get rest, also live life. And so we just don't have an environment set up to nourish moms. And even when we're under the best of circumstances, it still takes time to replete that nutritional withdrawal. And so I think a big part of the ways we struggle postpartum, in addition to the role transition, in addition to the stressors, in addition to the hormone crash, is the fact that, and the sleep deprivation, is just the fact that we're depleted and we need to rebuild. So I really like to support my postpartum and post-pregnancy loss moms and make sure that, or you know, in case of post-pregnancy, not necessarily moms, but basically to have people really re-nourish their bodies. And usually it requires asking for help which can be hard for some of us, but we need to start asking friends, can you drop off meals? Mothers or mother-in-laws, can you come stay with us and help cook for me? Partners to help out. Sometimes it involves a reallocation of resources away from other aspects of life toward whether it's a meal delivery service or a little bit of childcare so that someone can watch the baby while we nap or shower. Or someone can help prep food, like chopping onion can be a big help, just making it possible to nourish ourselves in the postpartum period. So that's my somewhat unique take on, on that aspect of, of, of women's health. That's really important because a lot of what's being done is just to give an antidepressant which may take the edge off for a time, but it's not going to resolve the underlying issue and may, may actually exacerbate the hormonal issues. Wouldn't, does it, is that a possibility? Yeah, it's such a tricky issue. I mean, I think for so many women in the postpartum period, it's hard to accept that something's not right. It's hard to ask for help. And I don't want to put any barrier to any of that, you know? And, and I think that it's also hard for women to sometimes come to terms with the fact that this isn't a blissful phase of life. Mm -mm. We it's have that message. It's really, the reality check hits home. I've had four children. Yeah, it can really yeah. hit home in that 
I bow to you, four children. It's amazing. I think we just need to normalize the fact that there's beauty and transcendence in creating life and bonding with our children. And there's so much exhaustion and struggle and triggering and stress and tears. And it's just too much in my household. What we call parenting, we say parenting is impossible. Being a mom is impossible. Exactly. And- Thank you for saying that. I think we all <laughs> feel that it makes us feel a little better. <laughs> And so I think that, you know, when, when a mom is struggling, I I want her to have a lot of compassion for herself. I also want her to certainly accept help and ask for help. And I think that there are different ways to think about how to get that help effectively. And for some people, meds is the viable solution. Yeah. yeah, To that temporary thing we spoke about. Yeah. But it's not the only solution. It's got, you've got to look at everything that you've been saying. Exactly. Yeah, it's not the only solution. And I think it's been the only solution in the public conversation. And that's where I'd like to change the conversation. Yes, that's why I wanted to mention that, because it's very important that you do, because it's really it, what you've just said, highlights it all. We've got to change the public conversation. That's just one tool in the toolbox. There is a huge portion that has to be addressed because that's not going to solve the problem. It's really just a temporary aid as opposed so to well anything. Said. It's not, not a solution. And then talking about there, the other thing is obviously menopause. I mean, there's those massive mood changes that happen there. And that also needs another conversation, doesn't it? I mean, that also needs another public conversation. What, what can you say about that? Perimenopause and menopause is a really tricky, unique subcategory of, call it false anxiety, in that it is a state of mood changes, heightened anxiety, insomnia, irritability that's due to hormones and then due to the impact that hormones have on things like sleep. And so it just makes it harder to stay mentally intact in general. But it's not something like other, like the other false anxieties. I've got solutions. It's like, you know, are you sensitive to caffeine and gluten? Let's go to decaf and gluten-free. If you're struggling in the perimenopause, Everything in my book is there to help. It will support it. But at the very end of the day, you're not doing anything wrong. If anything, this is an an idiosyncrasy of the fact that menopause is by definition post-reproductive. So there's no way to accumulate adaptations to it genetically over evolution. Because if one woman in our ancestry happened to be have a genetic mutation that made her have a better menopause, there was no way for that to, to garner a kind of fitness, like in terms of survival of the fittest, she wasn't going to have more successful reproduction or more successful offspring because she's in menopause. So she's by definition post-reproductive. So there's no way to build it into the genome. So basically it's just a design flaw that happens to happen, which we have no way of adapting to this crash in hormones. So what happens in the body in many ways is based on the precedent in our reproductive years. And what I mean by that is that a hormone crash to have an adaptive response to that is basically what happens postpartum. So a similar hormone crash to menopause is the the puerperium, the postpartum period. And that crash in hormones, then it makes sense to mobilize calcium from our bones and to create to create breast milk, which can then manifest as osteoporosis and menopause. It makes sense to radiate warmth because we want to have uh, our body radiates warmth to keep the nursing infant warm while they're, while they're lactic, while they're nursing. And that can manifest as hot flashes in menopause. It can make sense to have more disrupted sleep because we need to sleep more superficially so we can hear a newborn cry and respond to it. But in menopause, it just means the misery of really I struggle with sleep. So I think there's so many aspects about how our body responds to this crash in hormones that would have been adaptive in a reproductive phase of life, but they're maladaptive in the perimenopausal phase. And so it's just lousy. And I think that what I do advocate for is that rather than continuing to try to fit ourselves into the mold of this world, that says we should sleep for a consolidated block of eight hours, be worker bees that are productive all day long? Can we actually mold our lives to fit the fact that we're not sleeping as efficiently? Can we be a little softer on the edges in the morning, in the evenings, maybe in the middle of the day? Can we just support the fact that sleep is not going to come as efficiently? So maybe we need to fall back asleep early in the morning or in the middle of the day. And I think that there are some ways to just say, hey, this is what I need and I'm going to fit my life to accommodate that. Your mental health is and should be a priority. I learned this from my friend, Dr. Daniel Amen, who is a renowned psychiatrist, neuroscientist and founder of Amen Clinics. 
The AMEN clinics are unique because they use a comprehensive and holistic approach, including brain spect imaging, to treat mental health issues. I visited an AMEN clinic and seen Dr. AMEN in action, and I was able to see for myself how brain scans show that many mental health conditions, such as ADD, anxiety, and depression, are often not caused by just one thing. That's why giving everyone the same treatment will never work. So you can get a treatment plan that's targeted to your needs. I love that the doctors at Amen Clinics use natural therapies wherever possible. To find out how you can change your brain and change your life, visit amenclinics.com forward slash Dr. Leaf. If you book, you'll get 10% off an evaluation when you use the promo code Dr. Leaf 10 at checkout. The link and offer details will also be in the show notes. Gosh, Ellen, you have so much wisdom and I, just, I can't believe it's already like time's nearly up and so we'll have to do part two. I feel like we haven't even touched on everything yet, but is there something that you feel that's really important to leave with the listeners before we transition to planning for our next session? (laughs) (laughs) Our our next time together, I mean. Here's a couple quick actionable strategies to take away. I think one of the most impactful changes we can make is actually to just not bring the phone into the bedroom with us at night. And that change has various impacts on our anxiety level, both from the doom scrolling and the fact that there's no natural stopping point. So it kind of seeds our unconscious with unnerving thoughts right before we're trying to fall asleep. And it disrupts our circadian rhythm because of the blue spectrum light. So that alone is an intervention that makes a big difference. I try to encourage people to err on the side of eating real food and avoiding fake food. And that usually helps nourish our body, give our brain the raw materials it needs to produce neurotransmitters and have healthy receptor function and avoids unnecessary inflammation and things that can really show up as anxiety. And though we don't necessarily know that, you know, the processed foods of modern life being inflammatory leave us feeling anxious. And I think probably if you can prioritize really only one thing in your life, let it be community and feeling held in community, connecting with the people that we love, doing the hard work of showing up vulnerably, open to growth in relationships. It's hard work, but it's 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 the only thing that really matters at the end of the day. And we are hardwired to feel safe and calm when we're really held in community. And so I think that's the thing to prioritize above everything else. I think that's beautiful. And then also how you've also said throughout that to to embrace the anxiety as not as a bad thing but as a messenger it's telling us something you know and you've given a you give a very clear pathway forward into how to handle both aspects the false and the true anxiety and, and that's really amazing and also just the last thing I wanted to ask you is where we've right started right at the beginning which I think would be a, a great end point is that we can't just see the brain as the organ of the of mental health can we we've got to see so much more as part of our mental health Could you maybe just elaborate on that a little bit in in conclusion? Yeah, I like the way Will Cole puts it. He says, mental health is physical health and the health of our gut, the state of inflammation, the state of our blood sugar, whether or not we're getting good sleep, which gives our lymphatic system an ability to detoxify the brain overnight. All of this is impacting our mental health. So it's not just our brain chemistry. If anything, that's probably a downstream effect from other impacts on our health. So to just focus on the physical health and make sure we keep ourselves in balance, it impacts the brain, which impacts our mental health. I love that. And that keeping in balance also means that not about you, it's about you and the environment. So the environment plays that massive role as well, which then right. it kind of frees us all a little bit to realize, okay, it's not me. It's not, I'm not broken and defective. I'm just a human in life. So important. Yeah. We are we are not broken, we're not defective, we're not at fault. We are human beings with fundamental needs and the modern environment is not very conducive to getting those needs met. And so to give ourselves a lot of grace about that, but also to take to to bring awareness to it and to take some steps to make sure that we're getting some of those needs met so that we can feel better and carry out fulfilling lives. Oh, that's incredible. Thank you so much. And Ellen, where can people get your book and find out more about you? This yeah, is the so book. the book, The Anatomy of Anxiety, it's for sale wherever you buy books. You can read more about it on my website, which is ellenvora.com. And then I'm pretty active over on Instagram at ellenvoramd. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been enlightening. And as I said, we'll have to do part two soon. Thank you so much. Dr. Caroline, thank you. I hope you found today's podcast interesting and helpful. If you want more tips and help with managing anxiety, depression, and mental health, be sure to visit my website at drleaf.com. 
and to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I also include a schedule of my speaking events and so much more. And follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Just look for Dr. Caroline Leith. Also, I love seeing all your posts on social media about this podcast. I love seeing what resonates with you and what you've learned. So be sure to continue posting and tagging me and letting me know what you think and how these tips worked out for you. And don't forget, leave a review and keep spreading the word about this podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new and helpful. Till then, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf. This podcast represents the opinions of myself and my guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult your healthcare professional for any individual medical questions you may have. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions or corrections of errors.